All right, so I freely admit I download pictures from the internet, okay? A lot of these pictures come from the internet. If you put it up on the internet, I'm gonna download it and use it in my slides, okay? Yes, I have all my references at the back. I tell you where I get them from, all that great stuff, but I figure if you put it up, you must be putting it up for me, okay? So I have a bunch of pictures there to use. Again, um, I teach both uh, pediatric emergency medicine and emergency medicine at Augusta University, the Medical College of Georgia. All right. Yeah. All right, so now my favorite picture is the one on the left. Okay, that is awesome. <clears throat> so it says, I don't know if you can see it on that, but it says on his chest, hard to kill. Okay? Come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, recently, this has been a subject of mine. My colleagues in the back know I'm really into tattoos, especially gang tattoos. I've wanted to learn about the gangs in the Augusta area and in Georgia, so that's been my focus of research and understanding what gangs, what, what tattoos do they use, what is the symbology of it associated. This is not, this is not a symbol of gangs, okay? That's just stupid. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sure many of you have your own gang, or I'm sorry, tattoos that have been really funny, right? But you can tell me later. Hopefully not on yourself, I mean, but the ones that you've seen. So the goals here, discuss an approach to a difficult airway, present difficult airways, and discuss treatments prior to needing an airway. All right, so everybody knows the lemon, uh, Dr. Binion's lemon law, an easy way to remember multiple tests. So lemon, L-E-M-O-N, look externally, evaluate the 332 rule, I'm gonna come to all this. Malum potty, if you don't know what malum potty is, you really should, that's, that's sedation, I'm gonna come to that too. Is there an obstruction? And then does, does the person have neck mobility? Not just if they got the no neck thing, you know, you're gonna meet those people, right? They're pretty much all infants have like no neck, and then there's many adults that just, I don't know what happens, it's almost like their chin is right here at their chest. You're gonna meet them, that's a much more difficult airway type thing. But do they have mobility? We do have some people with kyphosis who can't, or maybe some other osteoarthritis issues that can't move their necks and hopefully not a halo, those are just terrible to walk up to. So look externally, okay? So yep, I downloaded all these from the internet, okay? Obesity, we have an enormous problem in the United States right now with obesity. Uh, I think it's approaching 40% is what I last read, Mississippi being the, the most obese state, uh, and uh, Georgia I'm sure is like right up there. Buck teeth, that's just a joke over on that side, but there are people whose teeth are much larger than, uh, than the average person. Dentures, this is something that I ask my residents all the time. We're about to intubate this older person. I'm like, is there something in his mouth that can come out? And they just look at me, I'm like, dentures? You know, take them out, it's so much easier to intubate without teeth in the way, right? Receding jaw, this, the, well, my pointer thing isn't working anymore, but the receding jaw, the the person who has a very small jaw, and then a short muscular neck. I couldn't find a good picture, but here's a turtle. <laughs> so if he has a turtle neck, <laughs> not the sweater, but. <laughs> All right, macroglossia, that's the greatest picture ever. That guy's got a serious thing going on. My daughter also has a long tongue. She can reach and she can touch her nose with her tongue. That's bizarre. I don't know if many people can do that, but I certainly can. Facial trauma, burns, burns of the external face is really what we're, I'm referring to, and then strider. That makes things a lot more difficult. So that's my look. Evaluate the 332 rule. If you, don't, if you haven't heard this, this is so simple. Adults only, of course, 332, right? Because it's three fingers fit in the mouth, right? You shouldn't be th trying to throw three fingers in the, in the child's mouth. But three fingers in the mouth, three fingers fit from the from the mentum to the hyoid, so right here, okay? And then two fingers fit from the floor of the mouth to the top of the thyroid cartilage, which is measured right there. So if you can do 332 on the patient, he's gonna be intubatable, if that's a word. You're gonna be able to do it. I have confidence in you. You will be able to do it. Malampati. Malampati is one of those anesthesia type things where you look at class one, class two, class three, if you look in her mouth, you could see the whole uvula, 
and more class one. You look in their mouth, you can see the vast majority of the uvula class two. If you move into class three and four, you really need to second guess whether or not you're gonna be able to intubate that person because now you've got much less area back there. So, and then I have definitions of class one right there, class two, three, and four. So I tend to do ones and twos. Yep, we'll probably try and intubate a three if you know things are going really, really bad. But if you have the time, I'd probably call someone else for the threes and the fours. All right, obstructions. I love this picture. I got this one again from the internet. So obstruction, there, there's lots of reasons that you can have obstruction. There can be blood in there, vomit is, because you know all of our patients apparently went drinking before they came in, right? I mean, that's like the law. You have to, you have to be drinking in order to have a four-wheeler at night with no helmet. That's like a rule. So vomitus, teeth. Many times these people have eaten the steering wheel because you know nobody believes in uh, in seat belts. So the teeth, epiglot epiglottis uh, could be uh, inflamed, dentures, get those things out of there, tumors or impacted objects. And I didn't put down, but you know, remember all your foreign objects, right? Many people have tongue rings and studs and all sorts of strange things in their mouth that are much bigger than they should have been. If you can get them out, get them out. Small tongue rings aren't gonna be a problem, but I'm starting to see bigger ones now, these very large, strange teas that they put in their tongue. I don't know if anybody else has seen that. I can't intubate with that thing in there. It's like a, it's like a little bar that sits on top of their tongue. I don't really understand why you'd want that because it would make it much harder to speak. Neck mobility. This is the only picture I could find about this. But anyways, neck mobility, the measure of the atlanto-occipital angle, and you can see you have a 45 degree there. So if you can get that person to come back fairly decently, at least a 45 degree, that will help you out. Uh, thyroid mental distance, we talked about that. That's over here. It's a, if it's a short distance, it's an anterior larynx. Greater than seven, seven centimeters usually means into, easily intubation. Less than six centimeters, difficulty. Disproportion. So I did put in a couple of uh, pictures, again, from the internet, but some children. The Pierre Robin sequence over here on the top right, that's one of those genetic malformations that has a whole bunch of sequences associated with it. It's a very small micrognathia, right? It's a very small jaw, really, really, really hard to intubate. Plus, they tend to be very, very anterior. Achondroplasia are little people. They can be easy or not easy. It's really very dependent, you know? So if you see one of our little people come in, the achondroplasia, you're gonna have to evaluate their neck and their, and their head and see whether or not that's gonna be an easy one. Uh, everybody remember, well, maybe some people don't, Jaws down there on the, top, on the bottom from uh, the Bond movies? Acromegaly, that's why he was so gi ginormous. They can have a stiffening of the neck, which makes it much more difficult to intubate. They obviously have bigger mouths, but their neck becomes more stiffened over time, which is why they can't ambulate and all that. And then in the middle is some more uh, difficult looking patients. All right. Neurofibromatosis, this is a, quite a severe one there, but if you have anything in the, in the lesions of it. Cystic hygromas in your children, those are those big cysts that light up. You put a, a light on them, it looks like you're creating a big old ball of light right here. Cystic hygromas, so this thing is in the way. It doesn't have to be a cystic, but I put that as an example. It could be a tumor, it could be whatever else. That's gonna probably make it a little bit difficult. And then this person here on the other part has been burned obviously quite a long time ago and ended up having all those contractures. I'm actually uh, looking more at new burns, somebody who just got burned and has all this flash stuff on the, on the front. Those make it difficult to intubate. Right, come on. Dysmobility, so uh, Klippel-Fiel syndrome down there on the right, uh, ankylosing spondylitis on the left, and then some sort of a TM joint ankylosis on the top. Okay, so I'm moving on to a different topic, epistaxis ma management. So I, I included that in airway because we get a lot of people who, you know, they, they ate their steering wheel, but they ate it with their nose and they go boom right into it and they have now a big old uh, blood, bloody mess. You probably want to take care of your bloody mess first, right, before you want to try and intubate. And sometimes you can avoid your intubation by taking care of your bloody mess. So let's try and go with that. Pain meds. 
Calm that patient down. They're freaking out. They're leaning forward because all that stuff is like dripping into their mouth. Calm them down. You'll probably do a lot better that way. Prepare. Gown, mask, suction, speculum, meds, unpacking, get ready. Anyways, be ready to go. Evacuate clots as best as you can. Topical vasoconstrictors for anesthetics, that's Aprin spray. Okay, you should have that in your emergency department. It's pretty cheap, pretty available. Not on back order and from Puerto Rico or something like that. Right? I'm sure everyone has experienced this by now, right? Everything's on back order, we can't get it. Aprin is not one of those. Try and identify the source if you can. All right, so packing. I have the old-fashioned packing up there on the top right. I've actually never done this, you know, using the packing material and you sit there for spending your long time. I've never done it. It seems like something that would be cool, but uh, it seems like something that would just take way too much time. I'm going to use a Rhino Rocket or one of those other devices. I probably shouldn't name a specific device, I know, but some sort of nasal tampon. I'm going to use one of those things. I like those. They're much easier to use. I don't know if we have any of the people out front selling these things, but they're actually great things to use and you really should try and use them. They're much simpler. A little bit of saline goes a long way on these things or a little bit of gel. If you're gonna shove these things into their noses, just make it just a little bit softer because those things are quite hard. But you push them in as far as you can go, right? Because you wanna get as much and then you inflate them and that's the way they work. All right, so here's another packing technique up there on the top right. Neat anesthesia and sedation, you may require uh, admission because you had so much packing in there. Some of these people end up with sinusitis because it's just so much packing, but many of these people can be treated as an outpatient. Once you can control their anterior pack, their anterior bleeding with that nasal tampon, you can tape the little plastic thing to their face rather than letting them shake it around, <laughs> tape it to their face, and then you can bring them back. You bring them back in 24 hours. There's great patient satisfaction to having that rechecked in 24 hours. It's really not a hard thing. You can have um, one of the people in front, uh, the triage people, nurse practitioners, APPs, whoever you want to call them, you can have them do it, but rechecking in 24 hours is a great thing. Most of my people tend to have these issues at night and on weekends, right? So it's hard for me to send them to their primary doctor. And I'm sure most of you have had the same trouble. You try and make a follow-up appointment with your primary doctor, you can't do it for the next day, especially right now in the flu season. So what complications do we have associated with epistaxis? Severe bleeding, hypoxia because they're swallowing so much, hypercarbia because they're really getting all anxious, sinusitis, otitis media, yep, because I'm blocking the eustachian tube, right? There's all this stuff coming around. And then necrosis of the columna or nasal ally. So that should not occur because that necrosis right there is probably due to you. You put that nasal tampon too tight, okay? So you squirted that thing up there, you pumped it up, and you didn't check the little bulb to make sure that it squeezes. So you should not be putting it tight enough to get yourself necrosis. All right, parotitis. Uh, usually this is viral. Paramyxoviruses are most common. You see this in the elderly, the immunosuppressed, uh, and I can see that didn't come out real well at the bottom there, but the management, staff, anaerobes, cover for that, hydrate, sialagogues, sialagogues is Great $10,000 word, right? It means lemon drops, sialagogues. So I tell people all the time, yeah, you need to go buy yourself some sialagogues. And they look at me and I tell them, yeah, lemon drops. Something that makes you produce more saliva, right? Warm compresses to the area and then pain control. All right, so here's a peritonsillar abscess. This you should have seen by now, I'm sure. Peritonsillar abscess is pretty common. Cellulitis of the space behind the tonsillar capsule extending into the soft palate leading to abscess. The pus is isolated between the tonsillar bed and the capsule, anterior superior to the anterior pillar. The complications, acute chronic tonsillitis, there's this Weber's gland up there. Usually it's unilateral, most common 10 to 30 year olds, so you're younger people. So this is like that strep throat thing, right? So it's the same age range, we're talking about strep throat and kind of goes crazy. So how do you treat this? If it's just cellulitis, you could just place them on a penicillin type drug, right? That will treat it up. Or a cephalosporin, because it's, it's all good, right? We could do those too. However, if it's an abscess, you probably need to poke it, okay? So that means you take a needle, 18 gauge, stick it into the, into the abscess itself. 
So many people worry about doing this because of, you know you got big red right here, carotid, you don't want to go there. So if you're going to place your needle and you go across to poke it, that's probably not good. You're going towards the carotid artery. But if you go along the tooth line and never go past the tooth line, you can't get to the carotid. Okay? So if you go along the tooth line or medial, you will never get to the carotid artery. All right. Uh, peritonsal abscess, I'm showing some pictures, left tonsil abscess, displaced uvula, the uvula is always shifted away from the abscess itself, right? And the right tonsil there looks normal. So if I was going to poke it, I'd go right down that tooth line straight at it. You won't get to the carotid artery that way. Uh, in, uh, so treatment, inferior medial, dis or I'm talking about what's it involved. So inferior medial displacement of the tonsil and uvula, it's a group A strep, strep pyogeny, staph aureus, H. influenza, and anaerobes. They'll have dysphagia, ear pain, muffled voice, fever, trismus. Treatment is antibiotics, clinda, IND, and plus or minus steroids. One of my favorite um, exams to determine whether or not this is involving the palate is having them say the word A and the, and the letter E, okay? So in order to say E, your palate has to rise. A, your palate does not rise. So if they can say A and E and it sounds different, their palate's moving, you're in a good place. If they can't do that, that's not so good now. Now the palate cannot rise and there's probably something blocking that. So I, I found has been a very simple, I'm not sure it's very, 100% all the time, but it's pretty darn good at telling me that there's a lot of stuff in the palate itself. All right, epiglottitis. Um, if anybody's seen an epiglottitis recently, it's probably been in an adult, because epiglottitis in children has pretty much gone away. Uh, the last time I saw one, I actually was a, a resident at Jackson Memorial Hospital down in Miami. That was the last time I saw an epiglottitis in a child. We now have so many vaccinations, especially the Hib which has prevented epiglottitis in general. So almost always it's now adults. We still have the epiglottitis uh, page out or something like that. You know, you page one number and you get everybody, the ENT, the uh, anesthesia attending, everybody comes running in, you know. So really we only use it now pretty much when we have something bad airway type stuff, not actually epiglottitis. But there should be a pathway in your hospital for it. Acute inflammation causing the swelling of the uh, uh, superglo eh, superglottic structures of the larynx tends to be in older children and adults, really now much more adults. Uh, onset is rapid. Patients often look really bad. They tend to look toxic, right? They come in, they're really not happy, they're leaning forward, prefer to sit, they have the muffled voice, dysphagia, drooling, restlessness. So avoid agitation, don't put that IV in them. This is a person who needs to be gassed in order to be intubated. Direct visualization, if the patient allows it, so that's gonna be an adult person who maybe doesn't look so bad. Soft tissue of the neck is an easy one, I got a picture coming up. Prepare for emergent airway. So get out your trait kit. Have it next to the body, use it as a magic wand to prevent all the badness, right? Anterior posterior view is normal. However, the lateral view gives you the thumbprint. This is a common question on pretty much every board I've ever taken in my life has this picture. Pretty much I know that if they show me these two pictures, right, that's what I'm looking for. Always a lateral view shows you it. Swelling epiglottis um, or epiglottary, uh, epiglottic folds, fullness of the vallecula, there's a balloon hypopharynx, abscess of the retropharyngeal space, but mostly seen there. Okay, so here's another picture, direct, direct visualization. Kind of giving you the landmarks on the right, picture on the left. Okay, here's another one, looking straight down at it. This is obviously an adult, and they must have put some sort of marker there to give me all that red stuff around it. I, I don't know where this picture comes from, and it, it makes me think that this is probably gonna be from a, a cadaver lab. Okay, here's another big old picture. You see that nice big thumbprint there on the right side. Retropharyngeal abscess. So the anterior to the prevertebral space and the posterior to the and posterior to pharynx. So usually in children under four, this is not this is one that you will only see really in the children, not in the adults. 
lymphoid tissue in the space. There's pain, dysphagia, dyspnea, fever. This is another one of those I find they can't do the A and the E. They can't give you the difference. Swelling of retropharyngeal space on the lateral x-ray. So if you don't see it, think of your twos. Go to your C2, two millimeters ahead of it. Do I have two millimeters ahead of C2, anterior to C2? No, it's much bigger than that. That's where I'm looking. Pain, uh, pain dysphagia, complications, you can actually go to mediastinitis, right? Because this abscess here can track down and now come, come into here. All right, here's a, another, well, that did not work. The words are underneath it, but oh well. There's, there's bunches of arrows showing you where all the problem is. We're looking at an anterior space, and then here's retro. So you can see the intubation tube, the nice little circle in the middle, and then he's got that abscess going there on the left side. Ludwig's angina, that one you've probably seen by now. That's the one that makes everybody worry. So Ludwig's angina is rapid bilaterally spreading cellulitis inflammation with possible abscess formation of the superior compartment of the suprahyoid space. So right there, right? So it's almost always underneath the jawline. A good, uh, a good physical finding on this is have them extend their tongue out. If they cannot bring their tongue out towards you, there's a problem. Because that is submandibular space, right? To do that, you're pulling out at the submandibular space. Usually it's in the elderly. Uh, debilitated patients and precipitated by a dental procedure. So the last one I saw was actually just this last week. It was a dental procedure. She had just had all her teeth ripped out. You know, the three that were left, she had all of them taken out. And she ended up having an infection. Massive swelling with impending airway obstruction. So usually what I find is I get a unilateral, so underneath the jaw, coming right towards the midline. It's just there. It hasn't yet gone across, but it's firm. They can't bring their tongue out. They may have trismus associated. You, you should be getting a CT, CT with contrast to see how big this is. This is one of those that the oral surgeon needs to know about, or whoever does that in your area. It could be an ENT person as well. So here's another picture. You see that nice blue area where the submandibular space, that's where we're talking about. That's the abscess forming. All right. Very tender swelling under the mandible. So they tend to be right here. Usually little or no fluctuants, tends to be firm by the time we see them. Uh, severe trismus, they could end up with some trismus so they can't, they can't talk to you, you know. Marlon Brando, they go to the dead all the time. Gross swelling, elevation, at least somebody laughed. They know who Marlon Brando is, but. Is he still alive? Anybody know? Uh, uh, tachypnea and dyspnea may happen. Danger of upper airway obstruction and death. The etiology typically from an uh, odontogenic infection, mandibular second or third molar. Streptococcus and anaerobes tends to be our, uh, our bugs of choice here. Remember, upper airway obstruction and death. So I've gone through, I think that's my last pre-stuff. Oh, no, nope, I got one more, Ludwig's angina. All right, so Ludwig's angina, uh, I'm continuing just some pictures here showing you some good ones on that. And then Ludwig's angina, the trismus, that person can't seem to open their mouth all the way. Management, ABCs, awake intubation. I think I started this by saying I love Special K, right? Ketamine, awake intubation. Ketamine's a great drug. You can give a little bit, one per kilo, 0.5 per kilo, you get some good, at least very calming effect. They have their eyes open, they really don't care what you do to them, and you can intubate them. Airway monitoring. This is one that you want to have to admit to the ICU, or at least some sort of step down. Drain the abscess. ENT or oral surgery needs to be consulted. IV antibiotics, penicillin, clindamycin tends to be our drug of choice in this case now, and then flagell as well. Clindamycin, it seems to be the big one. Angioedema, um, not just lisinopril, although lisinopril tends to be you know, the one that I see the most associated with angioedema. So here you can have the acquired one, which is an IgE-mediated vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. And then there's the hereditary, tricyclic antidepressant uh, known as doxepin is a good treatment for that. If you have the CI inhibitor, 
concentrate in your hospital. Very expensive stuff. Most hospitals don't have it. That is the treatment for hereditary. Most of the folks with hereditary will come in and tell you they'll have a card that says they have the hereditary. O so the treatment is oxygen, antihistamines, Benadryl, steroids, epinephrine, and FFP. Everyone has FFP in your hospital, okay? You had that. FFP is a great treatment for angioedema. You're giving them the pro-factors. Okay, difficult airway algorithm. So I talked about a whole bunch of stuff that are really scary when they come in. Now I want to swing over and tell you what, it's gonna, what am I going to do? What's my plan A? What's my plan B? What's my plan C? Okay, plan A is always direct. That's for me, it's old style. That's the way I like to go, direct laryngoscopy. I look in there, that's my plan. That's my first thing I'm going to consider. Quickly lately, though, we've gone to plan B. Everybody has uh, nice video laryngoscopies, right? Without naming any brands, I'm sure there's something out here, a video laryngoscopy type um, uh, product. Those things are awesome, because now you can see where you're going. They even got nice big screens for those of us who are over 40 years old, so you can see really, really well. I mean, those are great. And then plan C, an LMA, you can use some sort of other device. And then plan D is gonna be cut down. I don't like to cut down, so that's going to be my plan D. So there's direct laryngoscopy. All I can say for that is you really should know how to do that. However, you can use the elastic gum bougie. So this is a relatively inexpensive, long piece of plastic that you can, if you can't visualize or, you, or it's kind of like anterior and you're having trouble swinging it in, you can put, put this big old piece of plastic right into their trachea, you'll feel it because it will hit the rings of the uh, trachea itself and go click, 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 click. And now you're in the trachea and you can put your tube right through that, right over it and into their, into their airway. It will take you 30 seconds to do that. It's a cheap uh, uh, mechanism and I didn't name any brands on that because I'm not really sure what the brand name would be. There's the blind one for the, for, uh, the bougie on the right hand side. That's very difficult, although if you feel the clicks, you're, you're in there. Videos, uh, hopefully I've obscured the name of that video on laryngoscopy, but without naming the, the video ones, there they go. These are nice. Um, you can see where you're going, you have good views, you can try and get some better uh, airway. So I recommend any one of these uh, video ones, just become comfortable with the one that you have. Okay, flexible scope intubation, kind of a little bit more advanced, but Many people should be able to have that in their emergency department. You can, it's a device you can put straight into their trachea. You can pass the tube right over it. Just remember to preload the tube before you put that thing in, right? Because if not, you can't really get it back. Okay, here's an LMA. An LMA is a um, temporary device. As you see it being, uh, as the pictures show you over there, it can be done blind, it's put straight onto the supraglottic airway and it's blowing into the trachea itself and hopefully not in the, uh, into the esophagus, although that is part of the problem with it. If it doesn't sit well, it can blow a little bit into the esophagus instead of just the airway itself. And then finally, you know, you got to remember, you might have to do it. You might have to do it, uh, the, the, the trach, right? They got some great trach kits now that are like Seldinger, they're like a button thing, they're, you know, you just kind of like push it in all at once. If you don't do this uh, frequently, that might be something you want to consider, but you need to at least be ready for these kind of things. That's your last ultimate, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do that kind of a thing. You've already <laughs> called ENT, you've already called anesthesia, they're on their way, but the patient's crashing, so you're going to have to at least do something. Remember, you can always put an 18 gauge in there too, right? 18 gauge angiocath, you just shove it into the airway and at least you can insufflate through that, get a little bit of oxygen going and that will give you maybe a couple, two, three minutes. Hopefully the airway people will come there before you have trouble, but always remember, you may end up having to do it. References, uh, see I got lots of things from different places, ENT emergencies. And internet, I like the internet, internet's good. Do I have any, uh, Nurse practitioners here? All right, excellent. We have our, our nursing school, of course, is pushing out uh, nurse practitioners to rural areas as well. And it's been a, a nice thing to have now nurse practitioners within our emergency departments. I think that we call them APPs, apps, I don't know, it seems kind of a silly word, but our mid-level providers do a lot of uh, great stuff for us. 
um, and they certainly, over time and experience, do much better than my residents do. We have Wednesday conference, for example, where there's no residents. I'm only working with uh, PAs and NPs, and it's actually quite nice because you know nobody has bizarre disease, right? I've never had a nurse practitioner or, or a PA come and say, "Man, that guy's got zebra disease." Only my residents do that, and, it, and then you're like, "No, he doesn't have that." Come on, you know. So I like working with the NPs and the PAs. All right, any questions? Because I'm right, right about at the time. The good news is. You have a break. Even though you had me for a whole hour, you got you now have a break. So everybody go stretch, get One some second. coffee. Oh, sorry. Um, Tara. Uh.